The following is a recording with Lilith Brockhaus. I'm uh, 27 year old, years old and I'm the co-founder of uh, Visual Makers and um, I live in Cologne <laughs> in, in Germany. Lilith is the CEO and founder, one of the founders of Visual Makers, a learning platform that enables you to learn and become a master of the no-code movement. Yeah, I started uh, Visual Makers together with my co-founder last year. And we want to want to kind of share our knowledge um, and our and enthusiasm about about no code, because um, I don't have a technical background at all. Uh, six years ago, I wanted to be an actress, <laughs> okay. and maybe we can come to that later. Uh, and kind of got my way into the tech world with no code. And Alex um, comes from the other side. He's actually um, an IT guy. He was an engineer worked as a product manager uh, for quite some time. We talked to Lilith today about a lot of different topics, uh, how uh, no code enables, how you can be a founder with an idea and still bring your product to life without writing any code, um, how it's possible to build MVPs with a no code solution, um, how likely it is you're going to run into issues because a lot of people might think if you start down the path of a no code platform, you're going to not be able to iterate. But actually, as you'll find out in the interview, this is uh, something that is easily sidesteppable. Visual Makers is a learning platform uh, for no code. Um, and no code is uh, the way to, or a way to build software uh, without any knowledge um, how, to, how to code. Um, so you build processes, um, automate them, um, build web apps, apps, and so on, um, without having to write a single line of code. Um, you can kind of think of it as um, building a PowerPoint presentation, uh, by example, or building with uh, Lego bricks or something like that. Yeah, and if you are interested in learning how to use no-code tools, there is actually a special listener's discount in the description of this, and you can use that to get some discount on some of the Visual um, visual Makers Masterclasses. So click on that, uh, that link um, in the description, and then you can go ahead and check out some of their learning courses um, before you can make your big decision on how to start your founder. Founder? How to found your startup. Speaking of founding a startup, um, the Codes for Founders network the startup program we have here at codesphere and um, you can actually go to our website and you can click on the four startups tab at the top and you'll be able to apply for our startup program which gets you um access to free codesphere credits up to a hundred thousand dollars worth of credits to use on the platform as well as lots of other goodies to be announced things that will help you form your startup ecosystem from the very beginning access to lots of cool resources and events and communities and yeah we're really building a very cool little space to be in so click on um four startups in the codesphere website and apply today and i'll see you on the other side of that one You also have a podcast, right? The Visual Makers Podcast. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, we have a Visual Makers Podcast where we talk with people from the from the scene, like with founders um, of the um, the tools, um, like the tool providers. Um, but we also have interview um, guests who who build with no code and who work with no code on a daily basis, um, and also talk about like how do you use the right tool for your project and and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. Uh, that's our podcast. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so just an early plug on the, on another podcast for listeners out there. If you need something else to supplement your running or maybe your morning coffee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so no code then, I guess it um, obviously enables founders who have an idea to get something off the ground very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So um, before, I mean, founders have, especially founders who don't have a technical background, have the problem either you have to know someone who's able to to code uh, and um, yeah, no programming languages and um, or you need to spend a lot of time learning uh, yourself uh, to code or um, you pay really a lot of money uh, to some agencies or so or developers who are not your co-founders um, to, to develop an MVP or something like that. And no code kind of breaks this, this barrier um, and um, you're able also as a non-technical founder to, to build your own product. But I would actually say not only um, founders who don't have a technical co-founder or some someone technical in their team, 
um, but also the ones who are technical because coding a software like from scratch takes so much more time than just building it with no code, especially MVPs where you have like really limited functions and only the core functions of your product. But is it as flexible as coding? It depends. <laughs> it really depends. But one last sentence for, for our founders. Um, uh, because it's so much faster, you can iterate on your idea a lot faster without having mm -hmm. to spend like a lot of money and a lot of time to to develop a product that maybe your audience doesn't even like or want to have, right? I mean, yeah. that's a typical problem. And also for founders who are looking for uh, for funding, um, with no code, you can really show that you get some traction, that people are willing to pay for it. And not only with a click dummy or with, I don't know, a lead generation tool where you collect email addresses for your idea, but you have actual, you have an actual product, which was built like in two weeks instead of like half a year sure. or so. Yeah. So you mentioned though, it's like building with, with Lego, but then if coding is like, you know, building with clay then I guess Lego is a bit more limiting. So how do you kind of combat that in no code? How do people build whatever they want if it's like set um, function bricks, yeah. let's call them, you know? Yeah. So um, the easier a tool is, the more um, kind of limits you have. Um, but sometimes that's not a bad thing because, um, by example, it's, it's really depending on your business idea because uh, if you want to do, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm telling some some really basic examples like uh, if you want to do a job platform by example or any kind of marketplace or something like that that is built like a thousand times over and over you don't have to build that from scratch um just if you really want to have it really really technical okay that's a different story but these products usually get great because of great marketing great brand uh great people on board and the value comes not from the tech side so um, building these tools with no code really makes sense. I'm, I'm going to talk about um, or can talk about some, some use cases. We have like FinAuto or Upmin um, here in Germany, which these are companies that really, really scaled with, with no code. Mm, that was my next question, actually, scalability. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there it is. yeah it really pretty. depends, actually. So uh, you can't scale with every no code tool. Um, but you can, you have to choose the right ones. And it's kind of like the same as with normal core code or traditional code. You have to have to write architecture because if you don't, then everything just. Breaks. Yeah. After kind of thinking about, uh, starting your company with a no code solution, is it likely that, um, further down the line, you're going to run into like a, a hard brick wall, like you're not going to be able to continue, um, you know, the, the, the product because, you've kind of got stuck with the pro with the, the thing that you've built with no code. Mm -hmm. um, yes, of course, that can happen um, if you don't use the right tools. And it's always a question like which tools are best for which phase? Because, I mean, you could start with a really complex and a lot of functionality having no code tools. Um, but it takes quite some time to learn these tools. So no code doesn't mean not learning, not having to learn um, the tools that you're using. And no code also does not mean um, that there are no costs. So um, by example, Bubble uh, is one of the most powerful no code tools um, there are, uh, but it takes quite some time to learn. So we have, I've seen some startups who really scaled with this, um, and also larger companies using using Bubble, um, that is really really scalable. Um, but there are also companies who started out with um, I don't know tools like um, Softer and Google Sheets um, or Airtable or something like that, right? And um, you have some limits built in there, like with everything visual, of course, there's a little bit more code than if you would, or, I mean, no code doesn't mean no code. I think the word is actually also a little bit wrong because it's more like visual building. <laughs> okay. So, um, because when you, when you build with no code, of course, at the end, um, no code is your, um, what, what you get out of it. Or uh, no, code is what you get out of it. Sorry. Um, so no code, low code, and code are just 
different ways um, to get to your destination. But the destination is kind of the, the same thing. We've talked a little bit about, that, about around those topics uh, a, a bit on the podcast, actually, um, where this kind of like, it's not so much like, well, I started with this, so I'm going to finish with it. It's like, yeah. where's the tipping point? You know, like uh, we interviewed um, somebody who uh, has a, um, a workshop, an online workshop platform, and they started off as basically a companion to Zoom. So their no code option was Zoom. And then they kind of had this chat bot that would, I mean, sorry, a chat, a chat platform that would go alongside that that made uh, the interactions better. Yeah. Um, and we were talking a, a bit about a company that used a Google spreadsheet, basically somebody going into a, into a cafe saying like, I can optimize your supply chains. And basically they had a, a powerful spreadsheet that was doing all this math. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's, again, that's like another a no code uh, approach. And, and I mean, even Roman, I think Dan was talking about it from a code sphere point of view of like, um, you know, how you choose your tech stack as a company. Yeah, he, he made a really good point, then, saying that basically anything you use could be a, technically a tech stack, right? So even if you use pen and paper, it's still that that is the tech stack you're using. Yeah. So it's all about like founder choice. The interesting part about it is like as these lines blur, it's it's super interesting because Roman was talking about, you know, like in your code, the tools that you use, you know, like linters and um, little um, tools that they have, they're not, they're nothing to do. You don't have, any, it's not, there's nothing to do with the code. It's like, it's just tools that are built into the software that you're using, but there's all these little things that like stack and stack and stack. And then eventually, I guess, sometimes there's a tipping point and sometimes there isn't. Yeah. And also, I mean, if you see it like that, then no code is kind of the logical um, evolution of, of code, because I mean, code is also like you, you have so many plugins and so on that you use that nobody codes, uh, codes themselves. Um, and it's, it always gets kind of more easy and that's what no code does too. And makes mm. it kind of accessible for a lot more, um, people. I guess the question is like founder choice. Like when do you think a founder, um, or like when would you recommend someone uses no code against say a coding platform? So Codesphere, for example, is like a no ops, uh, platform or you can yeah. code, you don't have to code in it. You can just deploy something from somewhere else, but it's certainly not a no code platform. What it does do is remove this whole, um, DevOps issue of like hosting things and then you know, keeping them all up online and stuff. You can also debug and everything, but it, like you said, it depends on what you're building as to whether or not you go with a no code option or again, also your ability, can you code? Yeah. Um, but then, you know, do you have some, like, let's say someone's listening to this right now, there's a founder and they're thinking, okay, how am I going to build my, my MVP? I do have some coding knowledge, but I don't necessarily have a lot of time, but I yeah. want it to be quite flexible or quite unique. So is there kind of some categories you mentioned earlier, if you're building a, a, um, job platform, for example, that lends itself quite well to no coding because it's just, um, you know, APIs from job sites and then into a big list and maybe you have a profile predetermined, um, yeah. functions. Yeah. So what would be your, your feed, your advice there for new, newer founders who aren't sure if they should use no code or not? Um, I would say if you're really, if you haven't built anything yet, especially then, um, like if you have the idea for the product and want to test it out with your, as an MVP, but you haven't built the MVP yet. Um, I would always go for no code. Um, only if you can't, um, validate your problem with no code, maybe let's say, okay, some 3d scanner for, I don't know, big rooms or something like that right so i don't know <laughs> okay something like that is a big 3d rooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually i was in a co-working space where someone had like a, it 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 looked like a torch or something like that that you hold like in the middle of the room and then it scans the whole thing so i think that's something you wouldn't want to build with no code because i think no code is not yet able to do that um maybe with some apis but yeah, never mind. Um, so I would <laughs> always recommend to, to go with no code um, because you're just faster and you can, because an MVP is always about validating your idea. If that's interesting to your audience and if someone is willing to pay for it. And that needs to be really fast and you need to iterate like really close to your clients or your potential clients. Um, and you're just faster with no code. Even if you can code, 
it takes longer to iterate your product, uh, to build your product and to iterate your product um, when you do it with uh, with code. And that's mm. why I would use always no code for an MVP. You only get uh, one chance to deploy your MVP as well, right? So it's like so use code sphere. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but, the, but I guess this is the point, isn't it? It's like use use um you know it's it's not one or the other. I think uh, the best example I think I, I can remember in recent times is at Monzo, um, an, a, a, an online bank in the UK, where they basically were getting so hyped in the press because they were one of the first, like, you know, like a kind of N26 style in Europe mm -hmm. um, bank where it just does everything in app and you don't need all this sort of like, um, you know, um, branches and all this kind of stuff. So they basically, um, they launched a website, which was basically you could sign up and it told you where you were in the queue. And it was, and it was really like a thing to be like, to join this bank and, and kind of like count down to when you would, when you'd uh, have access. And then, once the first wave of people had access, then they launched the MVP. Yeah. Um, and by this point, it was just like, you know, number one on product hunt, became like the product of the year. Like all of this stuff is now, I think it's, it's easily the biggest um, online bank in the UK. Um, but obviously you, they, there's no way- You're a big fan of Monzo, aren't you? You think you yeah, tried to convert me once? They're really, uh, I'm, as I've said many times in this podcast, they do a lot of the things that, they, they're like such a better version of N26 without even knowing that N26 is bad. It's like a, it's such a good product. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, they, there's no way that you could build an online bank with, with no code, but they kind of like nailed this whole like adjacent thing where, uh, whilst they were getting this product to the point where it's like, okay, we're going to launch it and it's going to be great. You're using another tool to build hype and not, uh, kind of like shrug users off, which I think is really cool. Do you think it's, um, so no code has really taken off in the last few years. And do you think that's just because I don't know, what do you think it is? You think there's more entrepreneurs in the market who are maybe untechnical or unskilled founders and more people are trying more ideas than ever before? Or do you think it's just because of the accessibility of, of no code tools? Mm, I think it's more because of the accessibility. Um, and, um, because of the creative economy, economy, right? So everyone mm -hmm. wants to do something, or at least in in the bubble where where we are in, um, and wants to be enabled to do stuff themselves. And I think it's also not only for founders, but actually um, companies also see like how how much value no code can can bring to them, and when their employees are able to to build stuff with no code. Um, and so I'm pretty convinced that in the next 10 years, being able to, to no code, <laughs> okay, um, then it will be, become a skill like Excel or something like that. Right. So not everybody can do Excel. I myself couldn't do Excel like for years, like six years ago or so. Um, but you kind of have an understanding of how it works. You get the idea. And I think um, that is something that will be really, really important for companies where you have many people knowing about no code and kind of getting the idea and seeing automation potentials in their, uh, in their departments and so on. Um, thinking like, Hey, can't, can't we do, can't we build an app for that internally or as a founder? So, um, no code really democratizes tech. And I mean, in a more digitized world and, and so on, it's really important for almost everybody um, that has the internet connection um, to be able to understand um, how does an API, API work and so mm -hmm. on. How do I get data from A to B? How do I do a, is an app built? Like you don't have to be able to do it, um, but no code gives you the chance to understand the, the concept. Mm. It's also, um, it kind of completely leverages this idea that when you work in a startup or a really fast moving team, um, like being a jack of all trades, master of none is so important. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just, it just means it, the more people we've spoken to on this podcast, the more that you realize, like, I think some key personnel in a company to have like specific vision, but yeah. the more that, the more that the mm. other teams, the other team members can do the the better it works. And, and I mean, the uh, direct example I've got of that, which is crazy recently, uh, the company that I kind of work, um, kind of next to in my office, um, they, their, their sales team have started using, um, Webflow to, to kind of look into how to build yeah. their sales tool and stuff. 
and or like the designers work on it and create it and then they can tinker you know yeah um and it's this, this kind of whole uh this whole thing of um i don't know self mobilization i think in in a, in a fast moving company is is really uh is really awesome because it means that everybody kind of has a bit more of an oversight of like ah oh, well maybe we could do that maybe we could have that and yeah. you, you can put better input in and you also can take better um decisions with that because um, that's kind of the, the concept of a citizen developer, uh, which is a really ah, cool, good phrase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you think so? I, I don't really like the, the word citizen developer because it's like, I don't know, it, it feels like a two classes of developers, right? It's like, <laughs> I don't know, but, but that's just personal. So, but it's um, like citizen developer sounds like, uh, I don't know. It kind of feels like every, everybody could do it. It's like, you're just a member of a yeah. society and you can code. It's great. And, and I mean, that's the, that's the idea of it. Yes, definitely. And, um, where we go with, with our clients is, um, or, or the project that we do with clients where we say like, okay, you have an, um, department for engineering or it or something like that. And then, um, and they're really closed up and everybody needs something from them, right? So marketing needs to, to fix a typo in their landing page and they go to IT, but IT has something better to do because they have like more urgent problems. <laughs> so they wait for six months. <laughs> so same with the HR um, department, right? They, they want to, you know, they spend so much time copying and pasting data from one spreadsheet to another and from one system to another. And, um, you know, when when someone um, joins the company, the whole technical onboarding process and so on, it's crazy how much manual work goes into these processes. And yeah. when IT, I mean, they don't even have the idea that something like this can be automated because where from? Like they, they never learned or most, um, I mean, I'm not speaking for all HR departments, but you know what I mean. So um, the, and it's really important that the moment they realize like, okay, where are automation potentials in our department? Because IT will never know that because they're always external. And it's really important to have people, or I think it can be really beneficial to have people in the different departments, also in the non-technical departments who understand um okay, how can I automate things? How does no code work? And so on. And they yeah, know yeah. their tools so they can connect everything and they w they will do a way better job than IT ever can because they really know deeply how their processes work, how their tools work, what they need, and they can just do it themselves and they'll forget way more efficient. Um, so, yeah, Coming, kind of coming back to the <laughs> to the initial questions, like where do we stand? Why does it uh, does no code take off? I think that is some potential that eventually companies um, are um, are seeing, and that we're just kind of like in front of the the wave right now. Everybody hears like no code now, and it's like the cool thing now. <laughs> Okay. It's strange. It's strange. This is a bit of a, uh, this is a, a tangential comment of a, rather than a question. So bear with me. Right. Um, it's, it's strange the way that you can see, or one can see now these like loops of the internet, which is, I don't know, is only going to just be, is being kind of made aware to me by talking about this stuff, because I guess the whole thing with no code is it's kind of existed for as long as the internet has, you know, with like the mm. likes of Dreamweaver and those kind of tools that let you design stuff in browser um and then you know you'd post it but then that didn't i mean just because those existed didn't mean that the, the developers and, and creating websites from scratch didn't exist um but now you know you're talking it when you talk about it you can feel the focus is on this kind of consuming of an api taking data manipulating it and pr and presenting it in a certain way yeah and that's basically the modern web isn't it like that's the whole you know that's where we find ourselves like right on the brink of Web three is like the, the APIs, data services, and software services has kind of consumed the world. Um, so you can kind of see where this like no code movement is catching up to modern web development and allowing this kind of like role change within development societies as well. Like where people can say, okay, the development team can focus on these things that are you know you know problems that you couldn't fix with with. Uh, no code or like, you know, maybe you've got a website that needs to look beautiful and it needs to have like these perfect animations that are going to work in a certain way, or you're trying to do something like code sphere, which is like a crazy, um, difficult product. Um, it's really cool to sort of see that flow, isn't it? That like kind of like loop of, of how, uh, how kind of, the uh, 
the internet moves. I like it. I like kind of a bit of a history lesson. So that's my, <laughs> my, my observation over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Actually. Uh, that's a really nice way to, to put it. Um, so yeah, definitely. And it's also not about, um, like either this or that, but it's more, it's kind of it's more kind of welcoming, right? It's so, so yeah. we we will also always have the need for uh, for code and traditional code and really complex code and so on. But um, when more people have access, I mean, there's so much stuff to do. So it's a good thing when when more people have access and um, developers can really concentrate on on that. What is, um, yeah, really important. Mm. And I think you're going to, as well, I mean, if you're, if you are a startup with a tech team, working on a tech team myself, you're only going to empower the, you're only going to empower your employees more by saying like, look, don't worry, we've got all this boring stuff taken care of, or like the landing yeah. page is fine. You don't have to worry about the landing page, but like, if you can dig into these complex issues or the things that are really going to push the company forward, you like, not only are you empowering, um, like the you know, traditionally no code parts of the company by letting them take more of the reins in the tech side, but you're empowering yeah. your, your tech team by saying, okay, here's all these like difficult problems or like logic issues that you can work on. And yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's hard to understand why some people are so resistant to it. Is that, is that something you come up against much like a resistance to this kind of uh, mentality or is it generally quite positive? Well, in general, it's quite positive. It's a funny thing that, that we experience that, um, especially, um, developers who were not that experienced, um, mm. they were kind of afraid, I think, um, yeah. or I encountered that a lot. Um, and I don't know, made it a little, you know, belittled the whole thing a little. There was a yeah. lot of littles, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so it's kind of like, they they don't take it seriously, right? Because it's you know it feels like building bricks, and it's I mean it's a lot of fun. And it's not that complicated. So, um, but actually, what we've seen with very experienced developers, um, they were blown away from tools like I don't know Bubble or Softer, by example. We had a workshop um, in a software agency where we um, showed them some tools and how that can be beneficial for software agencies as well and for their clients and how they can use it in their own agency. And it was pretty funny because we thought like, okay, we have to show them the complicated stuff um, and so on because, I mean, they're developers, right? So we can't come up with, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, we say in German, clicky bunty, which is more like <laughs> click and colorful kind of That's word. That's awesome. <laughs> so, but actually... They love these clicky bunty tools, like the the ones where you really uh, drag and drop some blocks, like a text and a and a picture block, right? So you have an image on the right side and a text on the left side, and just yep. the whole block you you just drag. I and don't drop know if you've canvas. ever had any experience trying to like um, fiddle with the CSS to make that picture and text. Thing. <laughs> yes. That's probably yeah. why coders enjoy it so much. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, they were just blown away. They had so much fun uh, building with it and also with automation tools like Make or, or something like that. It's like, um, they really loved it and, and saw the potential. So, um, yeah, that's, that's something we, we experienced. Like the more, uh, it's, it's about how open you are. Um, and we also have one company in our, um, in our community. They are actually developers, uh, both. It's, it's a couple. Um, who started the company and, but they use no code as much as they can. So they're not going from the approach like, okay, we, we built our product on custom code or for our clients, custom code, um, and then build around that with no code, which is also a great, um, way to, to build software. I'm, I'm coming later to that too. Um, but they are going from, okay, everything we can, we're building with no code. And everything we can't, we kind of add on with custom code. Um, so mm. that was really interesting to see also that there's the shift to, okay, no code first and then, and then code. And I guess on that point, if there's, if there's a, if there's a tech, uh, CTO, uh, listening, thinking, okay, this, this sounds like something we can do. Does the, and I have no idea. So it's, it's, I'm genuinely interested too. Do the, do these tools like spit out 
uh, like, I don't know, like um, a, a React project or a JavaScript project or something that then you could take and then you deploy yourself and you can edit? Or is it all, does it all live within the, you know, like the, the kind of ecosystem of the, of like Webflow, for example, where it is, is that, um, yeah, I guess there's a lot of different options, but maybe you could walk us through those. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it really depends on the tool and uh, honestly, I wouldn't recommend it really. So, um, okay. Webflow, as you know, it has like, you, you can host it on your own servers and so on. You can export the whole code, but it, I mean, it's still running in Webflow, right? So it's JavaScript, but you, you kind of, um, so you have the same structure, but it's still like with all these classes and so on that you have in Webflow. So um, it, it works definitely, um, but I wouldn't really recommend it. I'm not sure if, if you can export code from, from Bubble, but with Bubble, you can like you, you can do so many, many plugins and, and custom code here and there. So, um, I think that's not really necessary for, for Bubble. So, um, I mean, what we get a lot is the question of, aren't you too dependent on, on tools? So probably that's also your question here right now, right? I guess so. It just sounded from what you described that story of the people in your community that sounded like they were just taking it and then and bolting stuff on themselves. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, the dependency because that's I mean, there's a developer myself. That's something that we're always trying to you're always trying to dissolve depend- dependencies. That's what makes you faster. So yeah. if there's a dependency on like, well, this person needs to know a tool that kind of can slow you down. So I guess it's just coming back to this tipping point um, <laughs> argument again. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, you're always dependent, right? So even if you have custom code and build it all yourself, you're still dependent on the person who's building it. And yeah. even if yourself, if, if, the, if that person is yourself, you're going to be the bottleneck of that. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's always the question like, who are you dependent from? We have also companies who work with, um, who said like, okay, we're, we're not that dependent with no code. So we're more independent with no code because we can just exchange tools very easily if we need to and add tools and so on. And, um, what I've also seen with, I mean, <laughs> we use that ourselves, even though our complete company and our complete tech stack is no code. Um, we still have, and, and our website is a, is a Webflow uh, website. So just CMS is Webflow. Um, but we build our landing pages with another NoCo tool, Softer, because it's easier to use. And it's not that, I mean, with Webflow can get complicated when you use a lot of classes and so on and animations and so on. Um, and Softer is the, the example that I just described with the building blocks, right? Where you drag and drop just these, these blocks uh, into your canvas. And we're using software for landing pages because it just goes so much faster. Um, even if you can do Webflow, you're still faster with software and that's totally sufficient. <laughs> so we even use that approach kind of enabling our team uh, with even easier no code. <laughs> Okay, uh, but that's just a side story. So, um, <laughs> how, it's like how much can you shrink it down? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, what serves your purpose best, right? So, um, but another example is from a befriended company who um, they built their their core product um, in traditional code, but everything around that is built with no code. So you have a sales process and the customer support process. So um, someone signs up on your website and, and wants to get a demo and then um, creates an account in, um, in your application and so on. But all these processes, because the, the external processes are kind of built with no code, they are um, separated from from the core product and you and the developers could really focus on the core product because you could change everything around it but it wouldn't affect the actual product because you just um send the the customer's data and so on uh, via api uh, to the tool and you don't have to change anything on the core product and you can still focus on on getting the features on your roadmap and and so on so i think that's also a really interesting approach which is quite important actually for product teams as well. Um, so that you kind of um, save your your developers capacities and, and the product teams the capacities on the core product that you really get going on your roadmap. My question really is how granular are the like 
um, metaphorical blocks, the Lego blocks you're using here? Like how how granular does it get? Can you can you put in like an if statement or is it pre-built functions or maybe pre-built <laughs> um, features, you know, make a chat yeah. window here or? Well, it depends on the tool. So <laughs> software, by example, is um, quite... I wouldn't even say limited, actually. It's just, it just serves a different purpose. By example, if you if you really want to customize the whole thing exactly to your with like animations and so on, mm-hmm. I mean, if your if your product is really about a lot of design and so on, then software might not be your your first choice. Then Webflow, by example, um, would be a better choice. Or Bubble. I mean, Bubble you can use you can do pretty much everything with Bubble, mm-hmm. but you still have to learn bubble so it's it takes quite quite some time until you get there especially if you don't have um a technical background before but um i mean if you if you just need a i don't know your ci and and so on then software is a great great tool and especially when you want to enable your your team um like with the example with the landing pages um then it's really great to to use that one because you can like preset all your images and your your CI and um, and you really build a website in like five minutes, including the sign up process and in some some form where you can, I don't know, collect email addresses and so on. Um, so how limited you are, it's really depending on the tool. You you can even with NoCode you can even um, build your own uh, algorithm. So there are startups like Levity, um, by example. Uh, started from Berlin, and there you kind of build your own machine learning algorithm. Because, by example, you're um, I don't know you're you're selling houses, um, or I don't know you're a real estate manager, and then yep. you get new properties and have a lot of photos from uh, from these houses, like a bathroom, a living room, and so on. And um, you have to to name them and categorize them, and so. You put them, you upload them into Levity, um, and then the algorithm learns to say, uh, like, okay, this is a living room and this is a bathroom and so on. And every time it's not sure uh, what it is, then it sends you a Slack message and shows you the picture, and then you can say, no, this is a bathroom, and a click on it in Slack, <laughs> and then the algorithm learns, and then you can kind of connect that to, I don't know, uh, Integral might make Zapier um, and work with the data that is built with your own algorithm. So it's not only tech enables people to build software, but also to um, yeah to de- to to develop your your own algorithm. So um, that's how far it goes, actually. Yeah, that's nuts, isn't it? That's like a, <laughs> it's like so far out of the reach of most people. Of like, I'm going to try and quickly make a machine learning algorithm, but oh, wait, mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a piece of software that can do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. what, what I was thinking about whilst you were, were, were talking then as well um, is that it definitely plays into topics that we've we've spoken about a, a bit on the podcast uh, around UX um, and UI as well, like refining and testing, um, and how you ensure that the the you know the product is as refined as it can be and like are you testing that user flow and um like are you intelligently making sure that the the there's no downtime between clicks or purchase points and stuff um but i guess a huge benefit of of using these kind of like uh tools is that there's so many guidelines that um if you're doing something as, as straight i mean the machine learning thing is probably a step uh, uh past this but if you are you know if you do want to streamline this whole process of maybe signing up or basically collecting somebody's information or asking them to buy something then surely because these platforms uh, are quite rigid they are optimized as well and they're going to give you guidelines of actually how to make you know this this journey for the user or your client as as, as smooth as possible or is it like a free-for-all and you can make it as crazy as you like and it might be the worst user journey in the world uh yeah the latter. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> that. So actually, that's a big problem in the non-code world because, um, I mean, for for code, you have things like Stack Overflow and so on. You have best practices. You have people who build a lot with code. Like someone always has experience. But with no code, we're not that far yet. 
um, because many tools are quite new and um, the tools, the tool providers themselves, I mean, we're always asked like, hey, can you do education for us and can you do some um, tutorials and so on? So um, the education part is quite, um, yeah, lacking a bit. That's why we're mm. here with uh, visual makers, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. So you still have to learn these things. So I started, uh, by example, with uh, Zapier. And mm. I had a bit of luck because um, some processes were already built. So uh, we built a whole um, purchase processes with, uh, with no code. Um, and checkout processes where we uh, kind of created a new invoice and sent that uh, directly to to the customer and um, and so on. So these were quite complex um, automations where I started with. Um, but that's kind of also how I learned to because I mean I literally had no idea about anything to do with tech. So as said, I I couldn't even do Excel. <laughs> so. Um, that really, because these processes were already there, that really helped me to understand, okay, how do I get data from A to B? How do I need to manipulate that um, to C? And I was, um, actually, one of the first automations I did was um, with a fast bill, which is a um, kind of accounting tool. Um, and I, and <laughs> at the time, they didn't have a Zapier app they have now um, and I needed to to send um, the data through the API with um, an XML file and so that was the first code I ever touched I think <laughs> except from from HTML um, or which looked to me like code the XML file <laughs> so I just started to to exchange some things and started to learn okay I, I removed a space here what does that change? And that's kind of how mm. I learned. So it took quite some time. Um, it was sometimes a bit frustrating and really, really rewarding when it worked. Um, yeah. So I would have needed someone to show me um, how to deal with, uh, how to build with no code, actually. So um, the education part is really something, I think you, you're a lot faster when you learn with someone or with a course or something like that. Yeah, of course. Um, and you also get well. get rid also of these problems like okay you're building something and you're then like three weeks later you see that your architecture is like um yeah a disaster <laughs> and then you have to build it uh, all over I've again never had so. that problem to be honest i don't know about you tim <laughs> <laughs> no, know, yeah. my, my code's always perfect yeah well, i know it's never, it's never written anything that required architecture <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, I guess that's also the downside maybe of this whole democratization of the tech process, because if you, if everybody can just weigh in and be like, I'm going to change something in the no code platform that we use because it's really straightforward and everyone can do it. It's like, does, is that, a, is that kind of like a, a downside? Is it, does it unravel quite quickly because everybody's getting their hands dirty and everybody's building stuff, which on the surface might seem great, but then, you know, mm -hmm. that's, I guess like the whole process of GitHub and, and, and pull requests and making changes and stuff yeah um kind of makes that flow a little bit easier yeah i mean uh, we had that problem before already in the 90s um with excel and access databases right so yeah, any yeah, anybody would build um an access database um and then that person would join another company or would leave the company and um and nobody knows how the the flow works so um, we had that problem, and I think therefore it's really important to, um, especially when you're in a bigger company, to establish some rules. So it's not about everybody does what they want, but that you have um, that you learn how to how to use the tools, these tools. That you also decide as a company, or with an IT department or so, or or as a founder. Actually, I mean you're way more flexible as a founder when you have a small team or in general startups, when you have a small team, but as soon as you get to bigger companies, like even with 20 people, um, it can be quite, um, yeah, when everybody builds their own workflows um, and, and apps and so on, it can um, get quite messy. So it's really important to, to have someone who's responsible for, like someone who's in the engineering or IT department or something like that, right? And then you have like yeah. satellites into the other departments um, who's responsible for um, for your no-code 
applications um, in the department in question. So um, it's really about, especially with automating automation tools, um, where that you use like not only in one department, like a Personio in HR or I don't know Mailchimp in marketing or so. Um, but that you use company wide, and there have really have to be some some rules and documentation and so on, so that is, is that it doesn't get like all over the place. Yeah, I guess, that, and that was a kind of question actually, not not from us, but for one of, one of our uh, community members. Community questions. Excellent. <laughs> there you go. It's beautiful. Uh, so this, thank you. <laughs> um, so this is a question from Sean. Thanks for the question, Sean. Uh, we were talking about um, prerequisites um, in a project. So when when you can actually identify at the planning stage when you should uh, when you should use a low code or a no code tool. Oh, I'm finding the, the question harder than I thought. Uh, so I would say um, every tool needs a no code tool, <laughs> yeah. or every every software needs a no code tool. So. Um, when you start with it, so having like the MVP we discussed before, um, and but also later for you need no code tools for for marketing, for sales, for um, for HR. So um, yeah, uh, for accounting. I mean everything that's also around the product. Um, I'm not sure if that's really answering your question, but. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess the, 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 I mean, the topics that we've discussed and like, I think the main takeaway for me is that, that like, I think you often think of a product as like this one thing, like, you know, you're building a tool, you're building a, a, a site that's going to help people scan giant 3d rooms or whatever you said before, <laughs> yeah. but really like just to get that to a point where that's just one part of it, you know, like the actual tool that you're building or the product you're building is one part of it. And even though that, that, um, might be built with a, you know, like CodeSphere, for example, which is built by, you know, developers with a huge tech background and a huge like stack to actually make the company work or to make that product work behind the scenes or adjacently to that, you need all these other things. And even if your uh, product is so technical that you have to build it from scratch, um, no code is kind of like so useful to just to support it at the very least that, yeah. I mean, after speak, after talking to you about it, I feel like if I was going to start a company, that's the first part I would jump into, just making a landing page <laughs> with a with a no code tool because this is so uh, just so flexible. Yeah, and I, I think the business needs no code. Not every product, maybe. Um, yeah, uh, maybe that's the difference. Like um, a product can be built also with no code, uh, definitely. But if the core product is is code, then definitely the business needs. No code. I think that's a good way to define it. Yeah, I think like the the product itself, it's hard to build like a very specified niche thing without any code whatsoever. But things like landing pages and even infrastructure and backend um, in terms of like internal infrastructure, yeah, no code seems like a much faster way to get things off the ground. Uh, same with um, with code, um, actually, like like payment solutions or something like that, right? So. I mean, there are always people who who still get the idea to, I want to build my payment solution myself and don't do that. Like even with code, <laughs> could connect to something yeah. like Stripe and so on uh, because there are people who really know their business. And um, I mean, maybe you, you need to still find your, your perfect solution. But for some cases that are also in the product um, there, and I would say Stripe is also kind of a no-code tool, um, where you connect to other systems that do something your business needs, but um, is not a core feature maybe of your product, um, to to put it like that, or also a sign up process or or something like that, right? Um, that's yeah, built like a thousand times from from others. That it's not a core feature of your product. Um, you can build that with no code as well. If you're a startup out there listening, thinking about building a product that's going to have to have a checkout and you're thinking about building the checkout process from scratch, then I feel like there's got to be a lot of <laughs> planning. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the don't do it section. Yeah, the don't do it section. The only other question I was going to ask, which is off topic, 
uh, I haven't put on the on the on the running order is uh, about your commu- community and how important community is for visual makers because um, it's something that we've talked about a bit with other guests and I think that maybe uh, it's often overlooked from a startup point of view of like how you actually build engagement and community and whether in- community is important for you mm-hmm. as a company. Um, so for us, for visual makers, um, community is is huge. Um, so I think we couldn't build a business without our community because, um, it's about for visual makers is mostly, but not only, but, but a lot about, um, excitement and, um, and the vision and kind of enabling. And that only works if you, if you get people excited about, about no code. And Alex and I started, I, I, don't think we really thought a lot about it, but um, in the first days uh, we started our marketing really personal, like all our content, <laughs> we put our faces everywhere. <laughs> like we use <laughs> photos from us and, and always kind of put ourselves as, as personal, as human beings kind of out there and told our story with it because um, we, yeah, I mean, I mean, my story with, um, from, from not techie at all to automation expert, um, and also his story, um, from, from engineer to, to no coder <laughs> and kind of jack of all trades actually, uh, yeah. also. So, um, we, it was a lot about stories and we, and also in our marketing, we, we tell a lot about these uh, stories from the founders in our community, from the companies who who use no code to solve certain problems. So it's always um, about stories and and personal, and that's where we want to set the spark. We, like our mission is to, um, yeah, to to make the tech world accessible to everyone. And I think that can be over mo- no code, and it's always about this magic moment, right? So. When we do workshops or, or people who, who join our community the first time and kind of heard about no code and try it out themselves for the first time, there's always like this magic moment where they're building something. Even, I, I mean, if it's an app or, or if they automate something, um, and they, they start building and then they try it out and it works and they build it and they build it them, themselves and they can use it and it kind of saves them some time or it, it's in some other way useful. And they really feel enabled. You always have this, yeah, this little spark that comes over, mm. which is really, really rewarding actually in the work that we do. So, and that's what we want to give to, to the people and that's really personal so and that's why it only works I think with community because no code I, I've never experienced a community not only the visual makers community but the no code community in general in general which is so supporting which is so open so interested and so welcoming and that kind of reflects in our community as well because there are people who are who want to learn I think when you're open to, to no code, then you're really open to learning and which makes you a more open human being kind of in general. Um, mm. So it all is also super fun uh, in the community. And, and I think, I mean, learning is always best with others. So um, yeah, community is uh, <laughs> it's one of the most important parts for visual makers. Well, nice. I'm glad we squeezed it in at the end then. <laughs> yeah, <it's a> good one. <laughs>